Hello and welcome to Tokyo Inklings. My name is CY. You can find me on my website at tokyostationpens.com, on my Instagram at tokyostationpens, and on Twitter at tokyostationmnh. And my name is Jacob. I am Fudofan on Instagram and on Twitter and have a blog at fudofan.com. And today,、um, I think it's like finally we have a day where we're not. You know, scrambling for the news because just so much has happened over the past, I would say, two months、mm. that we've, we've hardly been able to get a break, right? That's true.、Uh, we're going to start off by writing some,、uh, or no, we're not going to write reviews, we're going to read reviews. So I found another one star、uh, review. Should we read that? It's, it's a bit further up, so、um, it's, not, it's not as.、Uh, It's not in order, but we can read it if you want to. Sure, go ahead. All right. So、uh, let me start with the one star review. It's actually kind of a funny review. So Owen Anon, I think he meant to write Pen Anon, but he made a typo or she, I don't know,、uh, via Apple Podcasts from the United States of America on the 26th of April, 2021. Writes, keep it pen related. One star. Too much Corona talk.、Okay. Well, that's the review.、Um, so I'm sorry, Owen Anon.、Um, well, COVID does affect you know, our lives as well as you know, whether we're able to go out to pen events. So it is still a bit relevant, but、um, you know, we spent about at least, I would say, 80%. On pens, so you know, I, I hope if you can skip the COVID talk if you don't like it, you know, just skip ahead and you'll get to the pens. I promise you. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. All right, so then going back in chronological order,、um, we have 10 PH via Apple Podcast. It says United States of America, but I think they are from the Philippines.、Um, they say entertaining and informative. I'm new to fountain pens and I've learned a lot listening to Tokyo Inklings. Really appreciate the first hand accounts of their experiences visiting various pen and ink shows, as well as their experiences writing with the various fountain pen brands. The, sale,、uh, the episode on Sailor Limited Edition and the most recent episode on Pilot Limited Editions, as well as the up to date news on pen releases, are a great guide for fountain pen enthusiasts. Well, thank you very much. 10 underscore ph. We really appreciate your support、Thank、and you your five、much. star review. Yeah. Yep.、Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we haven't been able to go to a lot of these、um, events. And we might talk about、um, we might talk about couple event cancellations、uh, in this episode. But、um, yeah, so hopefully, we've, I think the state of emergency ends, I believe, just in two days. No, so it doesn't. Hopefully. No, it doesn't. it doesn't. So it's been extended. It's been extended at least to the end of this month. All right, all right.、Um, so, so we'll talk a little bit about, about that. And,、uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get back to these、uh, pens and inks shows. All right. The third review is、um, Yari Pri. I can't say this name. It's Y A R Y P R. So、um, there are either too many. Um, Ys are not enough,、uh, not enough vowels for me to read, but I'm going to say this Yarapur. I, I think I didn't say that correctly. But Yarapur says, Love this podcast. I love listening to this podcast. Informative and entertaining. If you are into fountain pens or just getting into the hobby, this podcast is a must listen. Five stars. Well, thank you very much, Yarapur. I'm very sorry for. Butchering your name. <laughs> I really don't know how to pronounce it, and there's just not enough vowels for me to say it out loud. So,、um, if you want me to pronounce it properly, you know, send me a, a voice、um, memo on Instagram, and I will definitely make sure I get it right the next time. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, so、um, going to the main show,、uh, let's talk a little about Apple. A little bit about acquisitions. We used to be very acquisition heavy because we used to buy like there's no tomorrow for some、right. reason. But I feel like we've both kind of slowed down a bit.、Um, but I saw these two pens 
And I mean, these aren't the only pens that I bought, but I saw these two pens that uh, that just really stuck out to me. They all mm. came from this one person. I think they're from Nagoya. Um, and I showed the mechanism of the first one on my Instagram stories, and it got a lot of um, attention. And the pen that I showed, or rather just the mechanism that I showed, is from a vintage uh, Vanco mm, uh, yeah. pen. And Vanco is one of the various, uh, let's say, smaller brands that used to make fountain pens. They, they were active even um, pre-war. And of course, by war, we mean pre-1993. Mm. Um, but they were pre-war. Uh, and... They they operated a bit into post war as well. I'm not quite sure when they they ended their operations, but Vanco was a quite a prominent um, pen maker. Obviously, not as prominent as Sailor, Platinum, and Pilot, but still, uh, they had a huge following, and they were they made very interesting pens uh, in various celluloids, um, really uh, heavily inspired by. Um, brands, Western brands such as Wall Eversharp. And um, the reason why my mechanism got so much uh, attention is because this is a Japanese made telescopic piston filler. And a lot of people don't know that uh, Japanese brands, or specifically Vanco, uh, used to make a telescopic piston filler. Now, for the listeners who don't know what a telescopic piston filler is, it's basically um, a piston filler, but it has two stages. Now, most of us, when we think of piston fillers, we might think of like a Twisby Echo or um, or a Pilot Custom Heritage 92, where you know you just screw it and it goes up and down. But right. a telescopic piston filler has um, two layers, so it goes up. And then the mechanism goes up again. So the reason why they did this is because when you make a telescopic piston filler, you actually get a bit more ink capacity because the size of the piston is essentially a third of what, uh, sorry, um, two thirds of what it would otherwise be. And a lot of people associate telescopic piston fillers with Mont Blanc. And mm, I did yeah. some digging around. I did some digging around on the internet. And it seems like Mont Blanc released their telescopic piston filler in, uh, I believe, 1937. And this Vanco telescopic piston filler um, had its patent um, filed in 1934. Oh. So, very interesting that... Uh, Possibly, um, the Japanese manufacturers were the ones to pioneer the telescopic piston filler. Now, there's not enough information, and to be honest, the design of the Japanese one, of this Vanco one, is very different from that of Mont Blanc. It's not a one-to-one um, copy, but for sure, it's interesting that they both had the same ideas. And it's very unfortunate now that Vanco is defunct because they used to, they just made the most amazing pens. But so based on your description alone, it sounds like these telescopic pistons are superior to you know the whatever you call the standard pistons. So why why wouldn't pen makers that still make piston fillers today? Why wouldn't they make telescopic pistons? That is a very good question because. Um, Telescopic piston fillers, you can imagine, are much more complex because you need to make uh, several different parts move. So in a standard piston filler that you can buy today, um, in essence, there are three parts to the piston. Um, Sometimes maybe four, but generally just three. The first is the piston rod itself. And I consider the piston head or the piston washer to be part of this rod. So you need that. You need a piston connector which is that um uh, most of the time i think it's some kind of metal or or plastic um connector that you attach from the end of the pen and then you have the piston knob 
and the piston knob is of course what you screw, right? So you only need these three parts to make a piston filler nowadays. But a telescopic piston filler has, you know, like six or seven different parts. Just the one in this new one that I got, it has the piston uh, rod itself. It has, um, it has a piston connector. It has, um, it has two little nuts. It has a, uh, it has a bolt on it. It has um, a the first sheath, the second sheath, and um, it has the the piston knob, and then it has a screw that goes in at the end of the knob to to secure the whole thing. So the parts are much more complex. But not only are the parts more complex, it's also a nightmare to um, to fix because you can't really take them apart. Mm. You can you can disassemble up to up to taking out the 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 piston itself, but you can't really take apart that telescopic piston. Um, or if you can, it's it's very um, it's very time consuming mm. and just overall not very cost effective. So, you know, we're talking about maybe an extra, you know, 0.5 milliliter worth of ink. Is that worth it? Uh, honestly, no, but it is pretty cool. Uh, the one that I got is not functioning. So um, hopefully one day I'll be able to find somebody to make a pen uh, with it. But overall, no. Uh, and right now, actually, I believe there is only um, a few people who are making telescopic piston fillers. Um, I believe um, Francis Gossens from uh, from Belgium. He, he's the designer of Conid, and I'm not sure if he's made his own or he if he's just uh, repurposed old ones. But he's definitely made pens from telescopic piston fillers before. And there's Phosphor, um, Phosphor pens in India. Who makes his own parts for the telescopic piston filler? Really, and that is yep, very very cool. All the parts are made uh, by him in house. That is very impressive. It also sounds, by the way, like the perfect challenge for uh, Pen BBS's mastermind, Mister Long. We should <laughs> send him a message. All right, Jacob, uh, that's your homework for next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure Kanesaki could probably make it too. It's just again, is it worth it? Is it worth the cost? Because Kanesaki is already very expensive. He, yeah, it will be more expensive than whatever Long makes. Yeah, that's for sure. The other um, pen that I got is a Maruzen safety um, filler. And I think the reason why this pen is interesting is because uh, most of the time when we hear Maruzen, even the vintage ones, right, they're mostly lever fillers, uh, otherwise they're mm. inkidome, or sometimes if you're really lucky, they're plunger fillers. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, they were mostly these balance types uh, or the onoto types. Mm. But um, we very rarely hear of uh, Marazen kind of being inspired by the U.S. brands. And we, we've talked about it before, but uh, they've definitely had a conical. Um, they've had a conical nib that was definitely inspired by mm. the Schaefer Triumph. And this is a... Uh, a ebonite um, ebonite safety pen which is inspired by the waterman safety pens uh, back in the day so they look ex almost exactly the same uh, the mechanism works exactly the same and it's just a very very cool pen I, I will need to get this pen re-tipped by, by somebody probably Greg Minuskin and maybe have to have Hiroko do a coating um, on the ebonite because it's all worn out but it's a very, very cool pen. It sounds like the, the final cost will <laughs> exceed the, the original. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you paid on Yahoo Auctions by a factor of, I don't know, big number. Yeah. I mean, I, I overpaid for these for sure. But I think they're very interesting um, parts of pen history, especially Japanese yeah. pen history. And, you know, maybe we should do an episode on some vintage brands uh, mm. in the future when we have time to do the research. Yeah, so about 
that I haven't read that much about. I mean, we have mentioned very briefly before about Marutan's history, the Athena pens. Uh, I haven't found much information about those pens, but one thing that is very striking when you search for Athena pens on um, Yahoo auctions is like the sheer variety of just like designs and filling series. Mm. They seem to have tried everything. They were the pen BBSs of their day. Exactly. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. All right. So um, that's what I've gotten mm. uh, in. I mean, the interesting ones. Mm. Otherwise, you know, I've gotten in a lot of you know, Sailor, uh, Sailor limited editions, um, you know, Serious Blue. But that's not so interesting. Um, what about you, Jacob? Right. So there are two pens that I haven't received yet, but I still wanted to just mention because I think they're interesting enough. So first of all, I got a I got a message from Hiroko this morning. She said that she's she's done with the the latest Urushi experiment that she she did for me. And as usual, we we talked about this before, but my pens tend to be kind of guinea pigs for her designs. And this one definitely falls in that category. I, I won't say much more than that, but I should get the pen tomorrow. I'm going to do an Instagram post about it. And I think this is one of her most uh, unique designs uh, so far. So keep an eye out for oh. that. <laughs> so you've already seen it. I've already seen it, yes. Nice, nice, it, nice. It's, a, it's an interesting one. So the other one I wanted to talk about is Drillog. So... You and I talked about Drillog for the f- uh, last year when we did our Tokyo Pen Show episode because Drillog was um, one of the most uh, interesting, if not the most interesting and surprising new product announcements at Tokyo Pen Show. So just a quick recap: these Drillog pens there are metal dip pens, but they are but the nib looks like a glass nib. Right, it it has these grooves like a glass nib has so that it holds a lot of ink. So you just dip it once and you can write like a whole page. But unlike unlike a glass nib, it's not very fragile. So you can easily yeah, put it in your in your you know pen wrap and bring it to uh, various events. So that that's sort of the idea and the appeal. And I think we were both impressed by these Drillog pens. And by the way, our friend Alisa, I think we said it before, but Alisa has done fantastic videos about uh, Drillog and we're going to do, I can link to that later. But we were both impressed, but they were kind of expensive, if you remember. Yep. Uh, because you had to pay first for, you know, the pen barrel and then separately for for the nib. Uh, and if you had one barrel that took two nibs, then <laughs> it was quite expensive, right? So... I've been tempted to buy one, but the cost has prevented me from buying one up until this this week. So there was a post a few days ago. It sorry, there was a tweet from Drillog's uh, official Twitter account, and they said that they are now participating in something called Furuzato Noze. And I think you see why I probably know well. Uh, you know what Furuzato Noze is, but kind of interesting. And I'm not sure if there is something similar anywhere else in the world. Um, so the idea behind Furuzato Noze is that in Japan you have these rural areas and that are struggling with declining population and because of that declining tax income so they have less money to spend on you know, public works and so on so there's this government initiative now called Furuzato Noze or hometown tax and the idea behind it is that you make a donation to your rural area, your city or town, municipality of choice. And the equivalent amount or almost equivalent amount gets reducted from your resident tax. So you're effectively just reallocating uh, that money, the, the resident tax to, uh, to a rural area. And in return, you're getting a gift uh, from the time you are making a donation to and that the value of that gift is roughly 30% of the of the um, of the of the um, donation so the idea is like you are making a donation to some town in Fukushima and in return they send you like a big box of like Fukushima peaches or something like that right that, that, that's the original idea which i still need to do <laughs> which i still need to do yes oh and um yes sorry you could also, and I know this is where you're going to get to, 
you can get more than agriculture. You can get stuff that um, uh, companies from that town or from that prefecture has created, and that includes pens. Yes. Yeah, so initially it was mostly like, you know, carrots and wagyu beef and stuff like that. But they have expanded the program. There are more municipalities, there are more companies participating now. So in addition to, you know, fruits and meat, you can get, you know, surfing lessons. You can get like tickets to hotels, you can get free meals and you can get products like stationary products. So, for example, if you are donating a sufficiently large amount to the town of the city of um, Hiratka, which is where Pilot has one of its big factories. You can get a Namike fountain pen as a, as a gift, right? So, so you're right, anything that is like locally produced in that area it can qualify as, as a gift. So that's how this yep. turns, going back to, um, to Drillog. So the company behind Drillog, is based in a, a city called Mino in Gifu Prefecture, and they are now participating in this Furusato Nose program. So, if you get uh, make a donation to the city of Mino above a certain amount, you can get a drill log pen in return. So, that's exactly what I did. So, um, you told me, I think, a few years ago, yeah, that uh you can make a donation and add 2,000 yen and you could get a shooting star of Jonuma pen. Yeah, so so what's the name of that? Mita Club? They, Mita, are, they yeah. are participating also. Yes, yeah, so, so they have both their inks and they have some of their pens available as gifts. Yeah. Um, so that's crazy because that is one of the most sought after pens uh, on the market. Mm. But we're not here to talk about um, shooting star of Jonuma. We're <laughs> here to talk about Drillog. Has yeah. it arrived? Oh, uh, it's not arrived yet. It hasn't it hasn't arrived yet. I think I should get it yet, just in, in a few days. Um, so this whole program seems almost too good to be true. Um, I think the only thing that's holding it back, and the reason why not more people are taking advantage of this, is that it's kind of complicated. I think you probably have done it before, or or um, maybe I, I have can't... not because it's uh, yeah, it's too complicated for me. Yeah, because I don't have enough brain power. <laughs> because in the first you know iteration of this program was was kind of complicated because you had to file your own uh, what's taxes. Uh, final taxes yes uh, which is kind of complicated but now they have a new system called like one shot or whatever they call it where uh, you get a form that you fill out and once you fill that out then then that's that's the end of it you don't have to do any more work but you but there are various um, like you have to qualify for that you have to be like a salaried worker and you can only apply for like gifts from like five municipalities or something like that but if, if you qualify for that then it's uh, quite easy now yeah um, I should really do that maybe I can get another uh, Jonah Muppet yeah the only problem is I mean obviously you're probably not the only one in the, in the household that is aware of this and uh there might be temptations to get other things like, you know, uh, <laughs> many kilos of rice or, or meat or something like that. So, <laughs> yeah, um, that's probably where it's going to go and get, and get like some rice or something. But, yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Yes. So those are our acquisitions. I'm really excited for you to get those in. Um, we've also had some online events because I, if you recall last time, we spoke um the COVID situation was getting worse uh, i'm not sure it's gotten better um but s some events were still uh held and notably you know we don't talk about that brand tono and limbs on this podcast um but they they did an event yeah and jacob you 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 attended one of the the lives and i attended one of the lives yeah, so I feel like we're sort of back at where we were one year ago. If you remember, like just one year ago, um, that's when we started seeing all of these like in-person events being cancelled and or or uh, replaced by online events. And I think Tone and Limbs were one of the first ones to to try to do it online. And they have since done this online like throughout the year. 
but then I think just one or two months ago they did an uh, a normal in person retail event at Okamoto ya. But then since then yep. now we have a state of emergency again so they went back to doing online events. So this was during Golden Week and I think last year there was another event during Golden Week too and we have talked about these events before. Um like if if your intention is to buy Tony Lim's inks or glass pens, then it's, it's quite frustrating because it's so decentralized. It's hard to find like, which you know stores.jp shop you should go to to buy this. And by the time you find out, it's already too late because the Numa crowd has already bought everything, right? So it's not a good shopping experience. But if you just want to watch a relaxing video of someone doing some lettering while you might, you know, maybe you do your own uh, calligraphy or do something on the side. And it's, it's, it's kind of nice to just have it on and, and look at it every once in a while. So, um, Jacob, you've heard this complaint um, before from me, not about Instagram. Uh, I agree with you. It's very difficult to find um, who's doing what yeah. because the way they're doing it is... Instagram has a function where you can ask to join somebody else's live and then you can live stream together. Yeah. But that's not what they do. Right. What they do is that each of their, you know, creatives um, have their own Instagram account and you have to go to their Instagram account and watch the live from their Instagram account. Um, Which, you know, is just just a huge hassle because you have to change between Instagram accounts Mm. and this event this time was like a five day thing from like the top of the morning right like 10 o'clock in the morning all the way to 10 o'clock in the evening it's a full day yeah and my complaint with this is that when you are watching an Instagram live Mm. there is no um, multitasking function. You cannot watch it in a window within a window. And right. that means that you cannot leave the app or you cannot look at some other person's uh, profile. You have to sit there with your phone watching this, this live unless you're on your PC. So so you're, you are stationary. I mean, no pun intended, but you're <laughs> just sitting there yeah. you know, for the whole day watching this thing. And you can't move around. You can't bring it around. So it, it's just very tiring, I think, to join these events. Mm. But they did get some prominent names. They, they got um, Addicted Planner stickers, which we talked about. And I think this time last year, uh, we talked about... Um, somebody asked who are the good people to follow. We, we said Addicted Planner stickers. At that time, she had 5K list uh, followers. Now she has 11.7K. So, you know, her content is really, really good. Right. Y'all have to check, check her out. Addicted underscore planner stickers. Yes, I, I didn't actually watch that one. I, I watched a few I watched a few others. Um, Moist one was pretty good. I also ended up watching the one by, by Lichtop. So first of all, there was a presentation by Morrison about, he talked about how pens are like, like a hamono, how they are like knives and you have to sharpen them every once in a while or, or they become unusable. <laughs> um, but what was interesting about that particular live stream was toward the end of it, they actually announced and for the first time on Instagram, I think, talked about this year's Wagner 3776 pen. So they mm-hmm. actually showed it. Uh, they actually showed um, showed it on on the video. So this is a grayish pen. I couldn't tell if it was gold trims or or rose gold trims, but it's a gray pen. And interestingly, it's it actually has the same um, like grooves, uh, like matte finish and grooves like uh, the Nice pens. Which, surpri- okay. which surprised me because if you remember, I, I did a post a few, um, I was, maybe it was last year about Wagner's 2018 pen. And when I did research for that blog post, I found an article or found another blog post by Morrison when he said that this is the last time we are doing nice style um, grooves or, or shape right, cut. because... Platinum didn't want to do it anymore, right? No, he said that that these are so prone to cracks. They have QC mm. problems. 
So I'm not sure what, if anything, has changed if if uh, Platinum has gotten their QC under control, but apparently they're doing a nice style um, pen again. So grayish, actually the, the color is called gray dew. So, so gray dew is like this, this fashionable hair color in, in, in Japan. It's like gray with a hint of beige. Oh, gray. Okay. Yes. Uh, and also there's apparently a little bit of, uh, of um, uh, sparkles. I think she, she said like uh, kira kira shiteru. All right. So I believe that means we'll have to get our hands on some of them. Yes. And also she, um, she showed the nib. So, so it, it's a uh, laser engraver as usual. And it's, um, I think it was like bara. So uh, rose, um, like some, some, some rose motif on it. Right, right, right. All right, that's interesting. So it looked, it looked kind of nice, actually. Obviously, uh, this being an uh, Insta Insta Live, you know, the audio, the video quality wasn't the best. So I only have like so took some blurry screenshots I can <laughs> send you later. But uh, it sounds promising, and and uh, the um, the nib engraving seems nicer than last year's. Yeah, you know, we we give Wagner a lot of a lot of hate, but I have to admit they've advanced. Um, the the hobby community quite a lot uh with with these with these special pens that they do so you know i do have to give them credit there uh i I hope that it's good i really hope that it's good yes me too and it's going to be um they're going to be available in june so next month so both to wagner members and it's going to be on uh, lichtop's online shop so i also attended one by uh, Addicted Planner stickers because mm. she's my favorite, and it's just very relaxing to to watch her stream. Um, I wish more of them did more regular streaming. Uh, I know Betchery does his all the time. Yeah. Um, but it, it is really nice to see them streaming, and I know that in particularly in the U.S., there's now a community of stationary streamers that stream. Um, about their stationary hobbies uh, on Twitch TV. So I'm going to try to watch uh, some more of those. Um, in particular, I think uh, Penguins Creative from the Stationery Cafe uh, is doing that. Um, Toasty Treat is doing that. Mm. Uh, I believe um, Miranda from uh, Havoc Rose Rights is doing it. And um, also... Ame is is recently doing it as well on oh, Twitch really? TV. So, yeah, there, there's a there's a huge community of mostly uh, of the planner um, category of stationary enthusiasts. But I think it's really interesting, and I might want to try my hand at doing something like that mm. if I can figure out the technology. Sounds good. But speaking of platinum, platinum has now officially uh, announced the. What they say is the last yes. edition of the Shunke series. We talked about this pen previously on this podcast, but now more pictures, or not more pictures, but the pictures have officially been lifted from their embargo. Mm. And the more I look at this pen, and I might be inviting trouble here, Jacob, but the more I look at this pen, the more ugly I think it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so there are a few things that are interesting about this pen. So first of all, we have talked about how Shiyun, uh, like seemingly based on our conversations with you know re- uh, retailers and so on, it didn't seem to be that popular, and also based on what we see on Mercury and so on, didn't seem that popular in Japan. Um, and two possible explanations were, you know, the price were 5,000 yen more than, than Rocca, and also the, the nib options were just E, F, F, M, and B, I think, so were no soft options. But based on that, this new one called Kinshu, I believe, it's a bit confusing because they're sort of doubling down on, on what made it not popular, right? Because this is even more expensive. It's 39,000, slightly more than 39,000. And it's the same nib options again, so no soft nibs. And they even have more of the pens this time. So, so Shion was 3,776. I think for Kinshu, they are doing 4,500 of them. 
I think what's interesting is that I think the Xi'an actually sold very well in the West. Hmm. I think it was actually sold out in a lot of Western countries, but in Japan, it was just an absolute disaster. You mm. can, you. I don't know a store that has sold out of their stock of Shein. Right, yeah, you, you can still easily find them. Yep, everywhere. So maybe this is more for the Western market. I don't know. But Xi'an was purple, and purple is a really popular color.、Mm. This time, Kinshu is kind of orange, and I feel like orange is just a very niche color. I mean, don't get me wrong; I like the color, but orange is a really niche color, and the and the、um, molding that they have this time is is quite funky. <laughs> you say that, and I think they're they. They're not bringing back the specialty nibs. They're they're sticking with their guns, and they're going with just the normal. I think what E F F M and Bs. And so, you know, I I really outside of the you know maybe you really like the funky ones, or if you've collected the previous four, then you know maybe you feel like you have to buy the the next one. I don't see a huge market for it. I, I'm sure some people will love it, but this is very much a love it or hate it. Pen, isn't it? One possible caveat here is that the information we have from、uh, Nagasawa and from Platinum's website it might be only for Japan. So if you remember, Kumpu was a 2018. It was only UF, EF, and M in Japan, but I think it came with like SF and or SM in other markets. So we don't know for sure whether it will have soft nibs in like US and Europe. Yeah,、um, I think I saw on some of the、uh, some of the other、um, stationers outside of Japan.、Uh, yeah, they just say more details to come.、Mm. So let's see. And then, of course, Kumpu back in two thousand eighteen was twenty five thousand yen. This one is almost forty thousand yen. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking on Platinum dot Pen though,、um, and it says E F F M N B. Exactly.、Yeah. Eve, but it doesn't say so in English. All right, but it does say that the new fountain pen is highly collectible. So <laughs> there you、good. go. Good to know. It is also ideal for fountain pen enthusiasts and collectors for its high rarity as the final model of the Fuji Shunke series. So better get on that. At the same time, it's it's the least rare of of the ones, right? Because Kumpu was two thousand five hundred, Rock and Shion was three seven seven six. This one, as far as I understand, is four thousand five hundred. Yeah, I'm not sure how this will do, but、um, the thing is, like, I wanted to do well, you know, I I wanted、mm. to do well because then they'll do more of it. But if they don't do well, then You know, then then they're not going to do more of it, and that would be a shame. It's going to be interesting to see what the price is in other markets. It was quite expensive.、Uh, Shein、yeah. was quite expensive in both the US and Europe, right? I'm looking at Pen Chalet, and they actually already have the、uh, the items up. So on Pen Chalet, the nib options are E F F M and B. Okay, same. And the retail price is four hundred and ninety five dollars. What was the shoe? And did you know that?、Uh, I think it was something similar,、um, but the street price for the Kinshu is three hundred and ninety-six dollars. So that's a good, you know, almost twenty-five percent off,、mm. I guess.、Uh, the shoe was four hundred and seventy dollars. So the Kinshu is actually more expensive. Right, right. I mean, by twenty dollars, but yeah, um. Mm, not convinced by this pen.、Um, this pen looks really bulky, and I'm not sure if you saw Nagasawa's post、um, where they had this. What was it? This thing、um, towards the very end, and you can see the different evolutions. Oh, it's a bookmark. So they're they're releasing a bookmark、yes. where <laughs> they have like. 
all of the different um, patterns mm. of the Shunke series, and you can see as it goes down, it gets wilder and wilder. Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure there is some cost associated with that. Um. Yeah, maybe they shouldn't have done this pattern then. I don't know. I don't know. The yeah. sales will prove me wrong. Yeah, maybe it looks better in person. We'll see. Yeah, so uh, I am excited to see this uh, in July. Um, but yeah, we will see. We shall see. I think I'm more excited about the Wagner pen, though. I, I, I suspect it's going to be cheaper. Yeah, and more attractive. Yes. All right, so um, obviously I'm not up to date with the state of emergency stuff, but you are. Can you, can you talk us a bit about that? So all I know... Um, is because I saw it yesterday that it's been extended now. So initially, it was meant to be until the 11th, right? Uh, but now they're saying that it's been extended until the end of May. And I think they've added some more um, prefectures. I can't remember exactly which ones, but, but, but basically we're not getting out of the state of emergency as right. soon as we wanted to. And this probably means that the event with Nagahara in May is going to be cancelled, right? I can't even remember what I was supposed to... Was, was that in Tokyo or was it in Hamatsu? I think it was the same um, venue as Tips with Eboya. Ah, that one. Ah, sh- yeah. Yes. Ah, that's unfortunate. I was, I, we, we, we were looking forward to that one. It sounded quite interesting. Yeah, so that's like two years in a row... Where the kind of like the high end, because um, I think they're gonna have like Stilo Art come as mm. well. Yeah, so I'm guessing that that's uh, that's gone bye bye. Mm. That's quite possible. Yeah, super super unfortunate. Um, and you know, uh, the last time we we talked about Nagahara, we did actually get quite a few interesting questions that we can ask him next time. Yes, that that, that would be good. That would be good. Yeah, I hope we'll get a chance to talk to him again soon. Yep. And um, so we haven't done Q&A uh, for a while now. So let's do some Q&A, shall we? Sure. All right. I'm actually going to do this uh, out of order, but um, we got a, uh, I don't know if it's a question or not, but maybe it's a comment um, from Zach Shahan. And Zach writes, See why? You are probably too young to remember, but there was a time when airmail was very expensive. Letters were charged by weight, so there was a special airmail paper which was extremely light. It was also very transparent. Despite these apparent contradictions, it was very high quality paper. Common names for this paper were onion skin and Bible paper. Officially, it is known as lightweight offset wood free uncoated paper. This paper is still available along with matching envelopes today, so what Midori is offering isn't either new or unusual says Zach I can sort of tell and, from, from your voice what you what you think of this <laughs> well I actually think this comment is very interesting because I think this is um, in regards to that super lightweight paper You're right um, from from the travelers b-sides so I actually think it was very interesting because when I initially read this I was like oh yeah you know um, a long time ago um, but yes, Zach, you are right. I am too young to remember that time. Um, but I, after thinking about this comment for a while, I remembered that I actually have a bunch of onion skin paper because uh, one day I went to our friend Kuei's house. And, um, you know, Kuei is a fantastic, um, I hope she doesn't mind me calling her this, but a stationary hoarder I think that's of fair. the highest <laughs> magnitude. Of the highest magnitude. And I remember um, we were playing around with her typewriter. And in her typewriter, she was using onion skin paper. And she mentioned that, oh, this is actually quite good for fountain pens. Mm. And I was very intrigued. So um, as one does, goes on eBay. And I buy a huge ream of this onion skin paper. So I didn't have like, like, you know. 500 or 1,000 pieces of this onion paper sitting in my guest room. And not only that, but I was very excited to get them made into notebooks. 
So, what I did was I took this onion paper, I went to Kyoto, and I had them make me a um, kimono notebook in Kyoto out of this onion skin paper. It was very light, I'm um, very excited, and I was thinking maybe I should make this my ink swatching book. But the issue with onion skin paper is that um, because it's very light, it bleeds and it feathers as well. So it's not actually the best paper to use for fountain pens. Um, and I think when we used it uh, for typewriter, the onion skin paper is clearly a one side only paper, right? So you can't write on the other side. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way. This super lightweight paper, and by the way, um, good friend Inky Rocks has a review of these B-sides uh, on her mm. YouTube channel, and that's a very good uh, review. I believe that this new super lightweight paper is not actually onion skin paper because the texture is totally different. I think it's actually more akin to their um, lightweight paper that they already have, but more similar to tracing paper than onion paper or onion skin paper. So, um, yeah, definitely I would say that these papers are really cool, really interesting um, to send mail, but they're probably not the most practical. Now, I watched a bit of, um, of Penguin Creative's stream where she was showing this, and I think one of the creative use cases is actually to layer drawings. Because, you know, on Photoshop, you can do, like, different layers, right? So you can probably do the same thing with this super lightweight paper. For me, that's the most interesting application there is uh, with that. But isn't that what you would use kind of tracing paper for too? Or um, do I misunderstand? I think tracing paper is not very fountain pen friendly. Right, right. And so it, it's, it's probably not the best. But this one you can use fountain pens on. And it comes in a book. Comes in the traveler's uh, booklet form. That's true. But yeah, thank you so much, Zach, for for your for your question. Um, I think it, it's super interesting to go through the history of these papers because obviously there's so many different types of papers uh, that that were developed that don't even exist today. Um, and it's interesting for sure that that Midori is is bringing this uh, this back. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree that it's not unusual. Uh, I, I think that it's not very common, at least in the current market. But for sure, it, it's not a new, uh, it's not a new thing for sure. You know this kind of uh, concept. All right, next question comes from uh, Bond Lao. Uh, Bond Lao asks, "Thank you for your recent great podcast reviewing the Pilot Pen Company." Uh, so he, he has two questions. The first one is during the conversation with Leo Folk. You mentioned the numerous types of nibs produced by Pilot, and you mentioned the Mu to Murex to Volex, etc. Is there a current successor to this line of nibs? You mentioned that the FA has been in existence since the 1930s, but I think it looks reminiscent of that particular line. That's, that's hard to say because we're talking about slightly different nibs here. So some of those nibs are what you might call like thumbnail nibs. And there's nothing exactly like that nowadays. But the closest you get, I think, are Pilot's Elite Pen and the, the, the Sterling Silver one. They have kind of inlaid nibs. Yeah, I would agree with that. What do you think about the new Falcon? I mean, if you compare to the Falcon nibs on, on the, the, the Pilot Super Series, obviously they're, they're bigger. I haven't actually tried the old ones, but obviously, you know, the shape is, is different. So, I mean, they might, they might be considered a successor in terms of writing performance, but definitely not, not in, you know, shape. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean um, the, pal the Falcon pen, not the Falcon nib. Ah, sorry. Yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, it's super confusing because they have a Falcon pen uh, the elabo yeah, yeah the el yeah elabo um which in, in the west is called the falcon um but the nib is called fa in the west but in japan i think the nib is called falcon and the pen is called elabo right 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 but yeah i think those look um doesn't look like the mu but it looks kind of like the murex yeah there's some similarity there yeah i agree with that 
kind of like a, a little bit of like a flat um head at the top mm. um so yeah I, I think the closest would probably be you know as you said the elites the the inlaid and the elabo or falcon to the mu uh murex volex um they did make the uh the m90 right yes it's one of your favorite pens <laughs> I'm bringing it up again. <laughs> okay, we don't talk about Jacob's M90. Um, and uh, the second uh, part of this one is, you mentioned the FA has been in existence. Um, I can see where that comes from because it's it's a bit more like uh, streamlined, right? In terms of the nib profile itself, although it's not really integrated. Right. I think given that the FA has existed since the 30s, and the Mu, the Murex, and the Volex were created in the seventies. I wouldn't really say that they are um, directly related. Right, right. All right. Second part of the question is: I have several pilot uh, pen nibs that are marked super quality. Is this simply advertising, or does this refer to a particular line of nibs with distinguishing features? I couldn't find. I mean, I was looking a little bit at this. I couldn't find anything, but. The only thing I could find is that Pilot says both on its website and on uh, there was one it was an interview on like buntobi.com where they ch- said that all parts of their fountain pens are even today made in Japan. We know that that's not true though because they did have a factory in China. Well, that's what I'm curious about because at at least today they have only two um, uh, there's only two countries in Asia where Pilot does manufacturing, and that is Japan and Indonesia. They have like, like sales marketing in like Shenzhen and in um, Taiwan, but at least today there's, there's nothing in mainland China. I don't know. I couldn't find any sort of evidence of any factories before. But you're right that like just a few years ago, suddenly we saw a whole lot of Chinese pens with what we call. Um, pilot style nibs so these like kelly arts and a bunch of wing song pens they suddenly all came with these nibs that were exactly the same shape as uh, no, the kakuno and the prero nibs yeah and those i think are the same um shape as these super quality mm. nibs as well um and i think that the story is that they had a factory in china but they closed down and um, one of the Wingsungs, because there's actually two Wingsung companies, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the Wingsungs bought the factory, so they, they got all of the the machinery to make these nibs. As far as I know, super quality means that it's not gold. That That's the association I make too. I'm not sure if they today have any steel nibs that don't say... No, wait, the Kakuno nibs, they don't say... Super quality Japan, but maybe all the other ones, the the cocoon and prayer nibs, they all say super quality. Uh, I'm not sure about the modern ones, but definitely uh, the vint uh, or not vintage, but you know, 20 years ago, um, the pens from there, I've definitely seen super quality. On right, them. like right, the right. the um, G, what is that one? The the steel nib that they 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 give you at the builder pens. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what you mean, but yeah. And then. Um, Bond finishes off his questions with uh, thank you so much for your interesting, fun podcast. Well, thank you so much, Bond, uh, for submitting the question. The last question is from Ame, and um, Ame asks, why do you like fountain pens so much, and what's your favorite part about it that Mm. keeps you passionate in the hobby? Ah, that's a good question. (laughs) Do you want to go first, or should I go first? Uh, I, I can go first. I've I've said this in one of the interviews I gave to uh, to Inky Rocks, but I think fountain pens are like machines, right? Um, they are very mechanical, they're very tactile, and they have all of these parts that all come together to do one very specific thing. And the mechanical aspect of pens is, I think, what draws me to fountain pens, um, because the the technology, I think, is actually just more... I think fountain pen technology is actually superior to ballpoints, even though ballpoints are more, let's say, used. But uh, So I have a ballpoint pen here now. It's a, it's a Muji um, 
uh, gel pen, it's a knock style. And so you have obviously the body, you have the knock, and then you have the little um, the little knock. Uh, um, I don't know how to call this, but the thing that um, keeps it all together mm. in the middle. And that's it. So it, it's very simple. And the technology is mostly in the ink. It's not in the pen. Whereas fountain pens, it's th- there's almost no technology in the inks. It, it's mostly water. Um, the pen has a lot of engineering uh, behind it. And I just think that that's so fascinating. It, this is like human ingenuity, right? This is, mm. um, this is like over-engineered like nerdery at the, at the same time though yeah, just to sort of respond to that about ballpoints being easier i remember or easy to make i remember reading an article fairly recently just a few years ago about how some chinese company had finally finally figured out how to make that you know the the, the ball part itself i guess or you know the, the most the most difficult part of a ballpoint pen so for the longest they have been able to make fountain pens without problems but but only like a few select companies in Japan and elsewhere were able to make the actual, you know, ball because there's so much precision work involved, and that was apparently so difficult to make. Yeah, for sure. I think it's like it's interesting because the the technology in in ballpoints or rollerballs, it's it's in the actual refill, mm. whereas you know in fountain pens, it's the the entire thing except the refill. Yeah, you know, dissecting and understanding how it works, uh, you know, that's really interesting to me. It's it's a lot of learning and also um, gives me input into you know how people used to design products. It, it's for me that's fascinating. And then of course you know um, the people that you meet. I, I think you know you can't really um, talk about hobbyist communities without talking about this. But um, you know, it's not just that these people are good people right like i think jacob is a good person um but he would be a good person even if he didn't like fountain pens. but for for me in particular what's interesting is that you know this good person jacob is so enthusiastic about pens that we've come together to create this crazy podcast which is you know listened to by 1500 people every two weeks that's that's crazy and that's humbling um that's uh that's inspiring and you know it's it's also about the passion that a lot of people are putting into this so-called defunct technology right Mm, right um the part i don't like is uh is spending money well (laughs) you seem to be doing it a lot though (laughs) apparently apparently this is one of the cheaper hobbies though that, that, that's like scary that, that's and, scary yeah i mean uh, people cameras. who are into fountain pens they, they tend, tend to go into watches and stuff and and, and it's all downhill from yeah. there what about you jacob i i tend to write a lot especially at at work i take a lot of notes like all day because i guess can't keep enough stuff in my head it helps me like remember it helps me think there's a certain clarity that comes from just putting like words and you know boxes and arrows on paper now obviously you don't need a fountain pen for that you don't even need need an analog pen for that but it's like you know cutting vegetables with like a, a sharp kitchen knife or typing on a good mechanical keyboard or taking photos with a like a hefty camera that has good like manual controls there's some you don't need it to get the job done but it's just more satisfying and and to me, just finding this, I mean, it's the same for most fountain pen people, just finding this perfect, you know, pen, nib, ink, paper combination, you know, this never ending search is probably what's part of what keeps me interested because my, my, uh, my preferences keep changing. Like I, I'm like a, a young child, except that instead of going from like a dinosaur face to a train face to a Pokemon face, I go from a cheap and cheerful Chinese pen face to an enormous an Indian pen face to a sailor face to a Mont Blanc face to currently a pilot face. You missed out Urushi in the middle. Well, uh, that's sort of it's an, an overlay. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just still in, in an Urushi face, yes. Um, so, yeah. so that's part, part of it. Um, 
the other reason why I sort of keep uh, why I'm still interested in this is you know the social aspect so through this hobby I've gotten to know especially in Japan so many uh, interesting people and although we haven't been able to do many pen gatherings now because of the um, pandemic I, I really enjoy these pen meets we have with you know Quay and Alessa and Hiroko and others in our Tokyo group I enjoy keeping touch with people online and what I think is so interesting is that most of us we come from like different walks of life we have different uh, our other interests are completely different and there's just this one thing about fountain pens that, that we have in common uh, but it's enough for, to talk yeah. about for hours although I have to say Jacob um uh, you and I are weirdly like you know when I was working in Omotesanda you were working like two stations away and then you moved to back to around Tokyo Station and then I changed jobs and now my office is like next to your office yeah. <laughs> that's kind of weird <laughs> it is a little bit weird yeah <laughs> but yeah uh, but yeah I think you know um, come for the hobby stay for the people yes, you know all that one. jazz perfect all right, so I think uh, we yesterday we, we, we met and we said let's make it a, a short episode. By my recording, we have an hour, so it wasn't a short episode at all. But let's let's uh, call it a day here. Yeah. And um, if you want to have your questions answered on the podcast, write into us at uh, TokyoInklings.com. We have a questionnaire sheet on the upper right, or um, I have also uh, a questionnaire sheet on my website um, as well. Uh, be sure to write in. And if you enjoy this podcast, make sure you go to uh, iTunes and give us a five-star review. Um, follow us, subscribe us, tell a friend, um, make it your Instagram stories, and make sure that people around you who like fountain pens, make sure they know about the podcast. A lot of people still don't know about the podcast. So, um, you know, if you know somebody who likes Japanese fountain pens or just Japanese station in general, uh, definitely please help us spread the word so that uh, so that we can uh, grow our following and, and reach more people. Mm. All right. Uh, that being said, my name is CY. You can find me on my website at tokyostationpens.com, on Instagram at tokyostationpens, and on Twitter at tokyostationmnh. And my name is Jacob. I am Foodafan on Instagram and on Twitter and have a blog at foodafan.com. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.